Now, some of you out there have already seen us rave about Aqua Viva by Clarice Lispector, which was published in 1973. But today, we're going into this book, Hilda Hills the Obscene Madame D, published in 1982. But I do want to address the elephant in the room, which is when some works of art come out, there's the conversation of originality of creation. And then there's also the discussion of derivation. Because to me, Aquaviva was the first time I had ever experienced a work of art that made me feel the way that it did and accomplished it in the way that it did. This is a book that is very easy to compare to that, but by no means is it meant to be a derivation. Because outside of Brazil, Lespector is much more well known compared to Hilst, which is a shame because this is a work of art that I think a lot of people would enjoy if they just knew that it exists, hence today's video. So in summary for this intro, if you read Aqua Viva and liked or loved it, you need to read this book. For everyone else, well, that's what today's video is for, is to go through and decide why read the Obscene Madame D by Hilda Hilst. So what are you getting with this book? This is a meditation on death, on time, sensuality, and even materialism. It's this moving blob and experience that you get to go through with Hilst as your Dante through hell, if you will. The main character is Hilly, or Madame D, D being short for dereliction. She's literally shut herself under the cupboard like Harry Potter and is cut off from the world, from life, from time even. But that's just the magic of where this book begins. Because only once you let go of all of your notions of what fiction should be, what books should accomplish, what characters ought to or not ought to do, can you begin your search. And to me, that's part of the core of what this book is is that search. The style of writing of this is very unique, where it doesn't follow traditional sentence casing, there's no capital at the beginning of most sentences, and there's not even a lot of periods, particularly as you get to the end. The commas just cause the sentences and experience to all flow together. And I started looking at the design of, okay, well, this period of he dropped dead has a sentence after it, and then there's Blessed Virgin, but... Well, then they're just talking about right after pooping, there's a period, and there's sometimes a mid-sentence break, like on page 46, in the middle of a paragraph and sentence. So once I gave up trying to articulate what the design is, the book really opened up for me of, of this is a search. This is the beginning, the question we're all asking. Seek to understand, Hilly, now that I am dying. Understand what, Ayud? Enunciate the illusions. Draw yourself away from the vortex. You're saying? Your search for its name, madness, annihilation, scission, dereliction. So to me, this talks about that search and how the search is madness and its acceptance of that madness that makes the search important. An excerpt from the book. Why is gold gold? Why is money money? Why am I called Hille, and why am I on this earth? I learned to name a great number of things, learn the names of a great number of people, but there must be a slew of things that have no name, and yet they never cease to be what they are. And me, if I weren't Hilly, who would I be? Someone feeling and observing the world. And to me, this talks to how words aren't adequate. Wittgenstein would definitely have issue with a lot of the questions in this book. He'd describe it as nonsense wordplay. That, you know, if you say it means this and so on, clearly we know what you mean when you say, you know, sky. When you say what is blue and you say, oh, it's the sky, it's this color here and so on and so forth. You should know what that means. But I think that is a very dismissive way of eschewing the fact of the limitations of language. And I think it's okay to explore those limitations because the and such and so on and you know what I mean. Those are the things that we're getting with Hill's writing. We can kind of intuitively understand and maybe counterintuitively use a Wittgenstein argument to further ourselves into her work. So some people may walk away saying, well, this was ridiculous. There were no answers. Well, I think that's kind of the point of this book is 
to dive into that search, to accept that we don't know the answers is part of the challenge and part of one of life's greatest challenges, which is to assign meanings to things. And we can't just skip over that because to skip over that, I think, is sweeping under the rug a large part of our human existence to understand. We talk frequently about how when going out in public, when going to work, when at a you know, your child's thing at school where you're putting on this professionalism, you're putting on this mask, is that you all the time in the privacy of your own home when no one else is watching? Are there sometimes other thoughts that you have, other things? I think we all hear the term skeleton in your closet. And what does that mean? Is the skeleton the real us? Is the real us the mask that we put on when we go out into public? What happens if you flip the role of those, right? What happens if the masks put up in windows are what are scaring our neighbors and we're all afraid when we know deep down inside that maybe some of us have these types of thoughts and inner demons ourselves that we keep tucked away? And is that the real us or is it the mask that we're putting on to face each day, to face humanity? And is that putting aside the real question of why does that mask exist to begin with? Which I think leads to the ultimate thing this book tackles with, which is what happens at death. Many religions talk about the tapestry we weave during life. The life lessons that we have made are what we're going to have to face, right? Our past is this immutable thing that we have to live with. And what if, the, to the Pascal wager, what if you have to face that at death? What would that mean? Because we have the quote, I must speak because death is coming. Isn't that so? And I think there's lots of eschatology to this. And I think I've never really tied together of the need to express, the need to seek out and understand others is because of fear of death. What if this whole existence and cycle of us needing to create things to live on in legacy is all because we're afraid of fading away to nothing, of being forgotten? And if we're forgotten, then what happens to our essence, to the original question? And I think that's an important thing for us to struggle with and understand ourselves of why do we do the things that we do. So she explores that in this book in a very carnal, very honest way that can be very off-putting at times. There's tons of language in this that can make someone blush, if you will. And maybe that's important for us to face our own masks, because why do we blush at some of these things when we're just reading it to ourselves? right? We're not reading it out loud. We're not in public. What a great way for literature to explore that inner part of ourselves that sometimes we have tucked away so far beyond in the closet that it's behind the skeleton that we're aware of in the closet. We even forget that's there sometimes. So we come back to the question, why read the obscene Madame D? And to me, it's that struggle, that push to understand our masks and our internal selves when no one else is looking and why we hide them. But maybe with no answer being provided, maybe the real reason is it's just nice to know we're not alone in this struggle. Maybe it's nice to hear that other humans are struggling with this, why do I do the things that I do? What does morality mean and what happens at death? To know that we're not the only ones struggling with this fear and this preoccupation of life and its purpose Maybe that just gives us a little bit more comfort to face each day. And maybe with that comfort, life is a little bit less scary. So while I recommend this book, it's not for everyone. It's only for those that really want to brave that carnal, internal self and question some of the bigger things in life, such as what's the purpose and what happens. So to me, I need to talk about this more. Hence why I'm going to be having a live stream with Noah over on his channel once again. So if you would like to interact or maybe see us explore further these themes and how they relate directly to us, I'm going to leave a link in the description box below where you can check it out and we can continue the conversation on this book. So have you read other Hilda Hilst books? Would you recommend them? I immediately turned around and purchased the With My Dog Eyes novel from her because I read that she wrote it while drunk on whiskey, so I, I just have a soft spot in my heart for that, and I just love this book too much is probably the bigger reason. So if you guys decide to pick it up, let me know your thoughts on this one, and if you'd like to read some more Hills, check out the playlist down below where we'll be continuing to have that discussion, as well as our talk with Noah on this book as well. I appreciate you guys spending some time, and I hope this has given you a little bit more comfort or reason to pick up this book. Una out.